We are carrying on with our practical past paper that we've been working through. It is the summer 2018 paper 31. So we worked through the actual experimental work in theory, and now we're moving on to the last part of our experimental question, so part 1C. So as you can see from what's coming, we're going to be working towards a graph. And this is what often happens is that you get your experiment, you do your experiment, and then you carry on and you have some data that is provided that you then have to graph and generally answer a few questions about. So we see here that milk proteins can also be coagulated using the enzyme rennet. A student investigated the effect of temperature on the activity of rennet shown by the percentage coagulation of milk. Results are shown in table 1.4. So the effect of temperature on, remember that is our trigger phase for our independent variable. The activity of rennet, this is then our dependent variable. So we're saying that we can see a difference. When we change the temperature, the activity level is going to be different. And therefore, we can see the independent and the effect on the dependent variable. So we're looking at measuring that dependent variable and we're measuring percentage coagulation of the milk. When you look at a results table, they also always have the same setup. So it's the same setup that you use when you build a results table yourself. We always have the independent variable on the far left. So this is a variable that you are looking at the effect of. It's the one that you are setting, that you're putting at different levels, that you're changing on purpose to see what happens. Then on our right-hand side of our table, we have our dependent variable, the one that's measured. So sometimes we will have multiple measurements of multiple measurements of the dependent variable, in which case maybe we've got multiple columns. But the idea is that independent is always the only single column on the left, and then we have these dependent variable columns on the right. So it all makes sense. We have temperatures 8.5, 28.0, 35.5, 41.0, 50.0, and then we have percentage coagulation. Milk, 7, 63, 84, 92, and then down to 39. So we're thinking here about um, enzymes because we are working with the enzyme rennet. So we should be expecting this kind of pattern that we have this change with temperature. So plot a graph of the table, uh, plot a graph of the data in table 1.4 on the grid in figure 1.4. And they even give you a nice little reminder. Use a sharp pencil for drawing graphs. In other words, if your pencil is not sharp, you can lose marks. And it's important to remember that the marks for these graphs are compound marks. So you have to do all these certain things in order to be able to get one mark. Then you have to do another list of these certain things to get one more mark. It's only four marks for this entire graph. So there's a few things that you should be bearing in mind as you do it. Remember, we always plot our independent variable on the horizontal axis. Dependent variable always on the vertical axis because the dependent depends on the independent. So we also always use the headings exactly verbatim as they are in our table. So the heading for our horizontal axis will be temperature slash degree C. So here we have temperature slash degrees C. Heading for our vertical axis, percentage coagulation of the milk. No spelling mistakes. Exactly as they write it. Okay, now we've got to figure out our scales. You can see that we've got bold lines and we've got lighter lines. Okay, so what we have is there are 10 little blockies in one big block. OK, 
Okay, so it's always going to be the same as that. And this is roughly a two centimeter grid. So these are roughly two millimeter blocks. When you want to sit down, now you've got to figure out, okay, what's my scale? Remember always that you're going to be given pretty much the exact size piece of graph paper that you need for your graph. So if we look now at our independent, we're going from 8.5 up to 50. So obviously we can't count in ones or twos, even fives is gonna be stretching it, but 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and it fits perfectly. So zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So remember you're always aiming for that, the one, the two, or the five or multiples thereof. So tens or twenties or fifties. You could count in hundreds, two hundreds or five hundreds. Or you could count in 0.1s, 0.2s or 0.5s. But the thing with working with these one, two, five multiples is that all of our in-between readings also are nice and straightforward. So if we look now at our vertical axis, okay, we're looking at the dependent variable. Seven is our lowest, but we're gonna start at zero. It's biology, we always start at zero. We don't have any funny jumping axes like we have in statistics. And then our highest is 92. So we probably have to go up to 100. So if we now look here, okay, well, tens isn't gonna work. Okay, so we go to the next option. Can we count in 20s? 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, and it's perfect once again. So, this would be 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to get now a pencil because those are in ink, right? We write in ink, but we draw in pencil. So here's our pencil. <clears throat> we also use a ruler in order to draw our axes, and we do draw our axes. Even though there's a grid provided for us, we're still drawing the axes. This bit with a ruler so that your lines are a lot straighter than my axes. You can use your vivid imaginations and pretend that I did those nice and straight. Okay, then we are ready to plot our points accurately. So let's just get that wobble out of the way. Okay, so we want to go 8.5 and up to seven. So at 8.5, well, this is 10 and there's 10 blockies, so each block is one. So there is an eight. 8.5 is therefore between eight and nine. And this is a 20, right? So each of these is now a two. So we want to be between eight and nine, and we want to be between six and eight, and to get seven. And we have to be on that in between. So there's a 10, there's a nine, so there's our 8.5, two, four, six. So seven will be in that block. Why does it want to bring? Okay, let's try again. Okay, the next one, 28 and 63. So not at 20, but all the way up at 28 and 63. So two from 30, we use those fat lines to really help us guide where we are. And then up to 63. So two and between. So not quite at four. Then the next one, 35.5 and 84. So there would be 30, one, two, three, four, five, 82, four, but 35.5, so slightly to the side. And if you see now, our points are in the gaps, right? Which makes it so much easier for our examiner to actually see them as well. And that's why they're giving us these in-betweens. They're a bit clever. Okay, so the next one, um, we did the 84, so now we need 41 and 92. So there's our 40, so there's 98, 6, 4, 92, and 41 is there. We are always plotting with an X. If you plot with an X, you know precisely where the point is. If you plot with a dot like this, where's the point? It could be anywhere. Okay, so X's are accurate and that's why we use to plot. Our last one, 50 and 39. 
So on this last line, 59. So 2, 4, 6, 8. Oh, wait, hold on. From 60, that would be 58. So this. I'm going backwards and forwards. I'm talking too many things at once. 39. There's our 40. There's our 38. So there is our 39. So you should always do your graphs without having a conversation because that enables you to actually concentrate on what you're doing. So let me just double check. Yes, we have got the right shape here. Okay, obviously we don't have a straight line as expected. So what we're going to do is we're going to join these points in a nice smooth curve. So with the pencil, And it is, I promise you, easier with a pencil than a digital pen. And it should go exactly through each of those points. And then you never, ever, ever extrapolate. Okay. We don't know what happens down here at a temperature of two. For all we know, it could jump up again. Okay. We can't assume this line from zero to our starting point of 8.5. We only ever draw our line within the points that we've plotted. So we keep our relationship within the data that we've collected. So now we've done our graph. We just double check everything. Sensible scales with numbers. And the labels for our axes match our table. We've got two axes ruled. We've got our points plotted and joined smoothly and accurately and perfectly with a sharp pencil. So we are now done with the graph and we are moving to the next piece. And here we have the pulling of our theory. So they are asking us to suggest explanations for the results between 35 and 45 degrees C. And then, if a student wanted to investigate the independent variable pH, a number of experiments would need to be set up. Say the pH values you would select and describe how you would change the pH. So we're looking now first at temperature and then thinking about how would we look at pH. So let's look at that 35 to 45. So here's our 35 and here's our 45. So we're going up. And we're going down. So you don't want to just focus on the going up bit. You want to focus on everything. There's lots happening here. Okay. So suggest explanations. Okay. So a suggestion. You're not expected to know the precise answer because you haven't specifically studied this or done this so you've got a very good idea because it's linked to what you've studied which is why we are suggesting explanations we're not just describing this curve not saying it goes up it goes down we're actually looking for explanations so we know that we're working with the idea of the optimum temperature but we don't want to really stick around and say, you know, you know what, the, you know, we're going to describe this optimum temperature is at because it's about the explanation. So what is happening? Okay, so above 35 degrees C, we've got this increase in temperature, right? So that means we have an increase in kinetic energy for both our enzyme and our substrate. So increase in kinetic energy of enzyme and substrate because that's what temperature really is all about when it comes to enzymes it's that, about that kinetic energy because it is all about the um the, the, the random movement and that probability of, of bumping into one another and then actually being able to to bond and have catalysis of the reaction okay so why do we have more coagulation up to 41 and then less after? Okay, so increase in, in kinetic energy, we can form more enzyme substrate complexes. This probability increases. So more whoa, enzyme 
substrate. Complexes formed up to maximum at 41 degrees C. What happens after that? Okay, is that kinetic energy has, has become so much that we have the movement within the molecules itself. Okay, so now we're explaining this um, as so. The, the, the reaction is going to, to get less because we're going to have at these higher temperatures less of a reaction because the enzyme is becoming denatured. That kinetic energy has gotten to such a point where there's too much movement within the molecule as well. So we have fewer enzyme substrate complexes above 41 degrees C as enzyme denatures. So this explains our results. The number of those enzyme substrate complexes is what is explaining our results. Do we have lots of enzyme substrate complexes creating lots of coagulation? Or do we have fewer enzyme substrate complexes creating less coagulation. So we're happy with our suggestion of explanations and now we shall have a think, okay, so if we wanted now to transfer this to pH instead of temperature, what pH values would you select and how would you change the pH? But if you go back here, have a look. One, two, three, four, five. There's your reminder that five is our magic number. In the same way that they tested five temperatures, you would want to test five pHs. Now you haven't been told anything funny about rennet, so you would assume that you've got sort of not much of an idea about what pH rennet works on, so you want to cover a nice broad range, okay? So how about five different pHs? Um, and let's go pH two, pH 4, pH 6, pH 8, pH 10. Or you could start at 4 and go to 12. It's all up to you because the thing is that what you want is a range and you want these regular gaps between. Because then you can say, okay, well, it looks like something weird is happening between pH 2 and pH 6, and you can zoom in on that piece. So having these regular gaps enables you to then break down the situation and move forward on your next step. Okay, so how do we change pH? We use buffer solutions. So you would use buffer solutions... to create each specific pH. There isn't any need for you to actually know how to create a buffer solution. You don't need to get into technical details. You just need to be aware that in the same way that you would use a water bath to change temperature, you would use a, puff, a, a buffer solution to change pH. So that takes us then to the end of the first question. So the end of the experimental work for this practical.